Hello, I'm Lynetta Tai. I'm the president of Playwell, which is a compliance consulting firm. I focus on helping companies navigate regulation, industry self-regulation, and indeed their own brand guidelines around issues related to privacy, user safety, advertising, marketing, other monetization models, and content. So uh, what is COPPA? As, as we heard Commissioner McSweeney discuss, um, COPPA was brought forth by a congressional act in the 90s. We're just going to do a, a slight walk down memory lane. Um, COPPA prohibits unfair or deceptive acts related to collection, use, or disclosure of personally identifiable information from children under the age of 13. So we're only talking about the youngest users here. The primary intentions of COPPA ensure that parents remain in control of the data that we as industry collect from their children. Ensure that we as industry are transparent about our data practices and minimize the data that we collect from children. So what does that sort of mean? General requirements of COPPA around transparency, one, post a prominent link to a clear and accurate privacy policy. Not just any privacy policy, as we often see, but make sure that it's one that reflects what you are doing, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. To obtain verifiable parental consent before you collect, use, disclose personally identifiable information from a child under the age of 13. And there are certain um, steps that the FTC has laid out for us to ensure that, that, that we're allowed to use to get the verifiable parental consent and that help to ensure that the person giving us consent is in fact the parent. We have to provide parents with a means to review the data that we have collected from their child if they ask us for it. Uh, parents can ask us to delete the data that we've collected from their child or to simply say to us, just no more. You can have what you've got, but you cannot collect any more information from my child. Finally, minimizing data collection. What that really means is you're only allowed to collect the data that you absolutely need in order to provide a feature or functionality no more. So if you can operate a sweepstakes for children using just a child's email address, which you can, then that's all you're allowed to collect. And, and delete it when you no longer need the data. So uh, COPPA is a regulation with teeth. There are enforcement mechanisms in place both the Federal Trade Commission and several state attorneys general are very active in enforcing COPPA. New Jersey is one of the active states, Texas, there are a few others. Um, but you can be brought uh, to respond to your COPPA mispractices by states or the Federal Trade Commission. So when the Federal Trade Commission is acting, what are the costs? First, there's a monetary fine, uh, $16,500 per violation which essentially means per app download, if you think about it in those terms. So the fines add up pretty quickly. But uh, as I like to remind clients, if you can write the check, there are a lot of other things that tend to come with these FTC settlements. One is deletion of the data that you have collected since, um, since your practices fell out of compliance. It's very hard to identify that moment. So often what we see in settlements are requests that you delete the data that you've collected since COPPA was enacted, which is the year 2000. So for many companies, that means forever, right? You're starting from scratch. Uh, consumer education. Uh, we've not seen this in the app ecosystem, uh, but in the website ecosystem. The FTC has a website uh, on guardonline.gov and for many companies who violate COPPA, they will ask that you link to this site from your own site for a period of five years. So this is a bit of the scarlet letter of industry. If you see a link to onguardonline.gov on a child-directed website, chances are it's because that requirement was part of a, of a COPPA settlement. You're subject to compliance training and audits. So you have someone like me come in for, say, a period of uh, settlements range, six to 20 years we've seen. Uh, and do audits of your compliance practices, report those findings to the FTC. Great for me, not so great for you. Um, many companies who are found in violation don't have business plans that see past you know, the next three years, let alone 20 years. Uh, this is money that you just never anticipated having to spend. 
one of the biggest problems, say you can, you can pay for all that and you're in good shape, you lose consumer trust. The, what you don't want to have when you're in the space of creating products for kids, for students, is the Wall Street Journal headline that says, Company Acts Violates Student Data Privacy or Children's Privacy. Extremely hard to recover from that uh, with consumers, with investors, what have you, with schools. So uh, let's dig into the weeds a little bit. Who has to comply with COPPA? Operators of commercial websites or online services that are directed to children or that have actual knowledge that they are collecting personally identifiable information from children under the age of 13. How do we determine what is directed to children? FTC has a, a threshold, a, a set of circumstances that they look at. We call it the totality of circumstances test. So they have a list of criteria, such as the subject matter of your site or service, the whether or not you're using animation, the types of characters you use, the type of music you use, the celebrities that you use. Do you have celebrities that might appeal to children? Do you have music that might appeal to children? And the FTC has said, by the way, that music such as Rihanna appeals to children. So the threshold right, to determine that distinction between child and teen directed is pretty difficult to do. Um, your intentions around who you intended the audience to be uh, are, it's very nice but it's not going to rule the day. You need to, we need to look at all the criteria and say, okay, in, in, in total, does this look like it's for kids? Does it feel like it for, it's for kids? It's really a sniff test. Um, what might sway things one way or the other would be uh, if you have analytics data that, that demonstrates that there are, there are not kids on your site or service. Um, however, uh, it, there are, complications in gathering some of that analytics information, uh, especially if you're doing it off a registered user base. You will end up oftentimes with registered user bases with median ages that are much higher than actuality. Uh, so it's not always going to rule the day. Uh, actual knowledge, what does actual knowledge mean? It kind of means what it, there's been a lot of discussion about this, it kind of means what it sounds like. Did someone tell you? Do you know that you're collecting personally identifiable information from kids? Did someone tell you that you are? Guess what? You have actual knowledge. So simple as asking for age? Yes. If you ask for age and don't take out kids or you allow someone to say they're eight, you've got actual knowledge. So Pat, you probably saw the settlement. Uh, Pat um, didn't screen out kids, and so several thousand kids registered. Pat probably didn't know. They just said age, and you could choose whatever age, and Pat paid a $800,000 penalty because I guess several thousand times the kids, times the number of times the FTC you know, decided it happened was $800,000. And one other one, though, in these other areas where the FTC sort of says deception, they can enjoin you from acting, and they might you know, force you to pay something, but they have to go to court if they really want to stop you. This is a rule, so they actually have the ability to say, fine, you violate the rule, you're fine. They give you a ticket, an expensive ticket, as opposed to we're going to go to court. And usually people don't want to battle. It's too expensive. It's, uh, so they end up settling and accepting these 20 years. So Google, Microsoft, Facebook, for instance, all have 20 year consent decrees where they pay for teams of auditors to you know, <coughs> charge them a ton of money to go through all of their practices for 20 years. Microsoft's been under one for like 10, 12 years, ever since like some hotmail issue you know, back in the beginning. Yes. So uh, you've looked yourself in the mirror and you decide, yes, we are directed to children. We do have to comply with COPPA. Um, there, are, there are a few things you want to be mindful of. One, are children your primary audience or your secondary audience? If children are your primary audience, then you need to treat all users as if they are under the age of 13. And we'll talk about what that means. So you need to comply with all provisions of COPPA for all your users. If you are directed to children, but children are your secondary audience, this would come into place, for example, if you have a site or service that is attracting users who are perhaps older teens, as well as some in the under 13 set. But it's really meant for the older teens. You need to comply with COPPA, but you can age screen you can ask the users, how old are you? What's your date of birth? 
you need to use a neutral mechanism. You can't tip them off as to what the right answer is. A lot of kids know that 13 is the cutoff, but we cannot guide them in any way. Just very neutrally ask them for their date of birth or their age, and then treat the users differently, whether they're over 13 or under 13. Under 13s get COP protections, and the over 13s don't, 13 and over don't. Um, however, you need to offer the users under 13 and the 13 plus users pretty much the same functionality. So you cannot age screen and then just kick the kids out. You've got to offer them all uh, a robust site experience. <coughs> also, if you are operating a general audience site or service and there is a section on there that's directed to kids, you do need to comply with COPPA in that section. And this is where a lot of companies actually misstep by um, forgetting to look at the iframe where you're asking people to sign up for newsletters and things of that sort. So if you're operating a general audience site or service, uh, but there is a section for kids, you do need to comply in that section. Yes? Ma'am, you're saying that if you, you, if you do the age screening, it's a secondary audience, you have to offer essentially the same experience. What if some of the experience involves the use of data in an adaptive way, including progress tracking and leveling? Right. So you have to offer essentially the same functionality. However, there are exceptions. Right? It doesn't have to be identical. So there may be certain functionality that you can only offer to the older users because doing so to the younger users would be in violation of COPPA or you can do it to, with the younger users but you have to get verifiable parental consent. So you can go one of two ways. What you can't do is just say, okay, you're under the age of 13 so you're not eligible to be here and prevent them from, from, from doing anything on your site or service. And, and you really don't want to be just offering, say, one or two little activities for the younger kids, but all this really cool stuff for the older kids. You want to make sure that everyone feels like they are having a robust experience. So what's personal information? It's different under COPPA as opposed to FERPA. You know, we, we hope one day our lives are made easy and we have sort of standard definitions for personal information, but right now we don't. So COPPA, under COPPA, personal information is first and last name, home, school, or other physical address, online contact information, a screen name that functions as online contact information, phone number, social security number, geolocation, that is uh, granular to, to the extent of city and town, uh, sorry, street and city. Photos, videos, or audio files. A persistent identifier used to recognize a user over time and across sites and services, and I'm gonna talk about that quite a bit. And then other data that you might collect about a child or a child's parent that, you, that is not personal, personal information, but that you combine with some of this information when that happens that non-personal information becomes personal information under COPPA. So it, for example, if you have asked, uh, collected from a child their name and their school, so you've collected their school address, their home address, and you've gotten parental consent for that. And then somewhere down the line, you offer the child some functionality and you ask them about their hobbies. It's non-personal information, right? Except you have all this personal information and when you attach it, hobbies becomes personal information. You need to protect it the same way. Yes. Um, for companies that are not the, the first collector of this information, like we just use in room as a Okay. Better, so they were not gathering information directly from students, they were housing tons of information that belongs to students that are related from other folks. As sort of a secondary owner of information, are they regulated under top of Yes and no, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what school providers who have contracts with schools, um, how they manage compliance. So yes, but um, in certain circumstances, the school will act in getting consent. And we'll, we'll talk about those details. So another hand up, yes. Uh, I have two things to clarify about PIN. Yes. The first one is the first, thing, first name only, does it fall into the? No, first and last name. So anything that can be used to identify, contact the child. Okay. So first name only is not personal information. The second one is if, if the, the activity data is not attached to the PII, then activity data or logs, they are not 
And we'll talk about that when we talk about persistent identifiers, which we're going to talk about next. But basic analytics tend to be allowed. Yes? Can we just get away by asking the parents to sign on behalf of their kids? Uh, there is parental consent, and we're about to get there. Yes. And, and no. <laughs> so um, there are a couple of pieces of personal information that I want to dig into a little bit. First is um, photos, videos, audio files. Uh, one thing to just keep in mind, not only is this personal information, and so you need to be getting verifiable parental consent before you collect it, but also remember that there is often geolocation and other personal uh, metadata embedded in these files. And so as an operator, you need to be aware of that and be protecting that um, depending on what you are doing with these photos. So for example, if you are collecting a photo from a child and you're going to disclose it, you're going to showcase it on your site or online service, remember that there's also geolocation data embedded in that. And unless you're stripping it out before you post it, you need to be sure you're asking the parent for permission for that as well as for the photo you collected. And so we'll talk about those exceptions when we, when we get into that parental verification mode. Yes? Just to clarify what you're saying, any photo, video, or audio that the child is presumably the taker of, like the collector of it, that's PII regardless, like not just profile photos like of the child, child takes a photo of the sunset. So no, child takes a photo of the sunset and submits it to you and submits no other information, not personal information, except there may be geolocation data embedded in it because we're all taking photos on our phones and we have the location services on. So that is personal information. And um, I guess related, like if the photo, if, if we're agnostic about the content of the photo, right, what, where, where does that line draw? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it, you're saying the fo photos can be PII. So I'm presuming certain types of photos are and certain aren't. Is there a standard? Or well, a photo of a sunset is not. But a, but a photo, photo that contains the child's image or likeness. Image or likeness, thank you. Right. Uh, audio files contains the child's voice. If it has their voice. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, is the personal identify or personal information used to identify them across space and time, does it have to be explicitly put on the device of the, the user? There, there was, I, I was reading um, this de-anonymization uh, uh, research study that happened recently where they were able to correlate a totally anonymized data set with um, users with a very small number of points. So data matching. Yeah. Um, Where's the line? That's, that's the line. <laughs> that's a good line. Um, so if you are, if you have anonymous data and you match it so that you can identify the user, you can re-identify the data essentially, it's personal information now. And so you need to be getting verifiable parental consent just for the users under the age of 13. The FTC was worried you could, the goal was to not let some contact right. Child, right? And so if you can maintain state with somebody, and I can give you a banner right where you go that says, you know, hey there, even though I don't know your name, I can market to you, I can communicate to you. So the goal was to swoop in that. So let's talk about persistent identifiers. Your, your um, IP addresses, your UDID. Anything really, any information, perhaps an, uh, an anonymous, uh, what you believe is an anonymous identifier that you hold in a cookie about a user. When it's used to recognize a user over time and across services, it's considered personal information. Um, when you are tracking a user across the internet, across different sites and services, across apps, and you're using that to then Create a profile of the user and target them with advertising that's precluded under COPPA. There is no behavioral targeting allowed under COPPA. Um, if you would like to think about doing behavioral targeting with a parent's consent, see me after class and we'll talk about all the criticism that you will find yourself under. You'll be the next in bloom. So quick tip, don't <laughs> answer this question. Who has a add this or a share this button on their Site. Do so not raise your hands. <laughs> so they're free, right? Free means in return for your information. So they share data with third party networks for behavior optimizing, sell it to third party data brokers. So if you're going to use a social plugin, you want to use one, um, and there are those out there that just did it because it's a nice thing or because you paid for it, but that doesn't collect that data about the kids you're serving and sell it. 
huge problem. Yes. So one thing to keep in mind with COPPA is that as operators of sites and services for kids under the age of 13, you have strict liability. Um, your partners, your, your plugins that you put into your site um, have liability if they have actual knowledge, then you have shared liability. Uh, but otherwise, it's on you. So one thing that's really important to do uh, around persistent identifiers is to understand who is operating on your site, who are your analytics companies, ad networks, what are the social plugins that you put in. You need to understand what data they're collecting. Around persistent identifiers in particular, um, how they're getting it and what they're doing with it. Because for a lot of these social media plugins, data is actually transmitted to the social networking company passively, just, sometimes just by being on the page. Right? So sometimes the user doesn't actually have to interact with the social media plugin in order for data to be transmitted. And if that data is being used for some purpose other than just to provide that functionality, which, hint, it is being used for other purposes, parental consent needs to have been obtained. And if, for example, Facebook doesn't know that you're on your site, and why would they? The liability is yours and yours alone for that data being transmitted and used for purposes for which you did not get parental consent. So it's really important to be vetting third-party practices to understand not only what they're doing, but their business models, how they might be repurposing the data. And you can't get parental teacher consent, for instance. Yes. The FTC, we can drill down more when the staff are here tomorrow, but they clarified just in case, hey, when the teachers signed up the kids for the program, the terms said, yeah, and for the ad support that makes this thing fun and free and so forth, the FTC made it very clear that that is not a potentially authorized educational purpose, and so a teacher or a school can't consent. Yes. In theory, a parent, if you're just a parent related app and you were really explicit, and you, you know, parents can consent to anything. You know, hey, put my kid's picture on the internet so he can you know, win a beauty contest. So in theory, a parent could consent to having their kid's data you know, sold or whatever, but schools and uh, teachers are not even able to consent. The little triangle eye that you see on ads, that's sort of one of the clues that the ad network that you're doing business with is doing targeted ads. Most of the ad networks that are part of the sort of the industry programs for self-regulation put a little triangle eye. There are ad networks that will do a non-targeted ad. They're far and few between. Assuming advertising is okay, right? But let's assume you're in a place where you know you've decided that it's okay to have you know ads on this. You do need to understand that most of the ad networks are in the business of you know using that ads to target elsewhere and enhance a profile. There are some that are not or who will agree to you know, serve just uh, basic ads and so forth. Yes, so in, in the good news department, persistent identifiers that you use for internal operations, so for example, basic analytics, uh, network communications, verifying a user, um, security purposes, legal compliance, things of that sort are not personal information. However, you do need to look at your analytics company's business model to make sure they're not repurposing that data. So. You, before you collect any of this personal information, you have to obtain verifiable parental consent. Um, and there are specific ways that we do this. Uh, FTC is big on reasonable measures and reasonable standards. So your method must be reasonably calculated in light of available technology to ensure that the person giving you permission is, in fact, a parent. The FTC lays out a couple of methods that they've approved. Um, the only one that I'll really spend time on, I think they're all pretty self-explanatory, right? Sign consent form, credit card when used with a transaction, so you have to actually charge the person. You can refund them back some later date, donate to charity, what have you, but you have to actually perform a transaction. Um, all, of the, all of them, except the last one, are required when you are doing something with the data, for example, that might involve uh, sharing it or, or surfacing, sharing it with, a, with another party. Email plus. Uh, essentially means sending an email to the parent, and there are specific requirements for what needs to be in the consent that goes to a parent. Right? You tell them what data you've collected so far in order to reach the parent, what data you plan to collect, what you're going to do with it, a link to your privacy policy, tell the parent that they can give you permission, they can opt out at any time, a lot of requirements that need to go into this, this permission. Um, however, if you're collecting the data just for internal purposes, what you can do is send that sort of email to a parent, ask them to give you consent, and then at a later point, 
send another email to the parent reminding them that oh, you gave us permission and giving them the opportunity to decline permission. It's essentially a way, it's what we call email plus, and it's essentially a way of ensuring that the person who gave you permission via email was the parent. This is only okay when you're holding the data internally. Exceptions to parental consent, one-time use. If a child asks you a question, or as I mentioned before, you want to run a sweepstakes, and you can do it in a way that you need to respond once to the child and no more, you can do that without getting verifiable parental consent. However, you must delete all the data as soon as you've responded to the child, all of it. Multiple contact. Uh, suppose you want, uh, you want to offer students the opportunity to sign up for a newsletter or some ongoing communication with you. You are allowed to communicate with them with the once, after which you must send a notice to the parent saying, by the way, we've collected this information. Your child has signed up for this feature. Um, we're going to send it to them periodically. You want to wait a reasonable period of time, give the parent the opportunity to opt out. If they do not opt out, you can continue to offer that feature to the child. Um, this, is, this tends to be used just with when you're collecting an email address and nothing more. This is not for bigger amounts of personal information for which uh, it probably wouldn't fall under that multiple contact exception. Your feature would probably require a higher threshold of consent. If you're posting to public forums, this is where the photo question and, and geolocation comes in. If you're posting personal information to public forums, or if you're, I'm sorry, if you're posting content that has been provided by a child to public forums, but you're stripping all the personal information before you post it, you're not deemed to have collected it. So if you collect photos of sunsets and flowers, you've stripped out all the geolocation and other metadata before you post it, you're not required to go through the verifiable parental consent process. Let's talk briefly about consent in schools. Schools may or may not choose to act in lieu of parents in providing consent. They can only do this when the data is being used for the internal educational purposes of the school. Any other commercial purposes for which you might want to use the data, you need to get consent from the parent, not the school. When you have a contract with a school system, you as the operator may presume that that gives you cover for consent. However, please, I beg of you, I see far too many operators who have a contract with a school system, and their contract says nothing about COPPA permissions, but they presume that since they have a contract, the school is getting consent. Do the school a favor. Tell them what you think that contract means in the contract, that, that you assume this means that they're, they're responsible for the consent. Um, I see far too many contracts and industry operators assuming that a contract in and of itself is fair game, which it may or may not be, but really not something that you want held up to scrutiny. Uh, reasonable measures, again, security retention deletion practices. You must maintain reasonable security measures around the data. You have to maintain the data only as long as reasonably necessary. And there are sometimes different statutes in different states around what is reasonable, depending on what you're doing with the data. However, as a general rule of thumb, if you don't need it, get rid of it. If your user has been inactive for a long enough time, get rid of it, unless, of course, you have a school contract that requires you to keep it otherwise. Um, and do the same due diligence around security and privacy practices with any third parties that you have uh, operating with you. They need to comply with your privacy policies, your security policies. It's your responsibility to make sure they're capable of doing that. So very quickly, common pitfalls. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of rushing through this, but I'm around afterwards for questions. Um, common pitfalls. Using existing pro products as your model, saying, oh, so-and-so is doing it. It must be fine. They're a big, reputable company. Please don't assume that because someone out in the market is doing it, it's OK. Um, you may not have the benefit of their big legal team. You may not have done your risk assessment and decided that there is a risk, but we feel like it's in a gray area. Or they may just be wrong. Um, write your privacy policy. There's an article on my website about writing a privacy policy, how to make it simple, how to make it complete and comprehensive. I don't want to get into too much detail because we're of time. However, um, again, please don't just copy and paste someone else's privacy policy. Um, at, at least substitute your name. <laughs> um, I believe it or not, I see that fairly often. Um, your privacy policy has to reflect what you're actually doing. 
Far too often I see companies and law firms writing privacy policies that if, do not reflect an actual product assessment. They reflect what you think your product is doing, not what's actually happening. Make sure you are covering the required legal uh, clauses, that it reflects what you're actually doing, and that everything you're actually doing is, actually, is allowed. Uh, given the, all the laws that you need to, to run with here. Then can I ask you to dwell on one uh, key point that, yes. that probably it would be useful to folks? So I, I think there's a lot of confusion around, I kind of am covered by FERPA because I have a contract. What do you mean I'm also covered by COPPA? When, when am I subject to some of the COPPA rules? When am I subject to none? So. Scenario one, um, uh, the school, you know, signs up for, you know, Joe Power School service and um, there's a contract and the data is all, you know, initially loaded up by the school. Um, I, I may or may not have to do something to, you know, activate the account and sign in. Um, uh, there are grades in here, there's homework. It's collected online, COPPA says, collecting online. So I get the consent is in an issue, either the contract and the terms that the parents uh, agree to at the beginning of the year. Um, COPPA doesn't apply because clearly the parents are not entitled to delete the teacher's grades and assessments and so forth. Even though I'm collecting it online, I'm kind of just a vendor here and I'm not even collecting. The school is collecting. I'm plumbing. Uh, the school says, sign up for this service. Teacher or administrator gives permission, but I go and I register directly. Everything else happens. Maybe even grades are in there, but there's an account created. Same data's in there. It's now Jill Power School Service, except the teacher, th there wasn't a contract. The account was created by the teacher, I get to delete the data and I'm subject to these tracking and these other COPPA restrictions. Am I, am I right? You're I think I'm right. I think you're right. I don't know if I'm right. So if you are collecting data directly from the child, all provisions of COPPA apply. If so you're I'm not collecting the data directly from the child, if the teacher is uploading it, yeah. different provisions apply. Now. If you are going to, if you have a dual situation happening, right? You've got, you've got teacher is, is authorizing, uh, is uploading data in the classroom, but then you're also a, a, a site or service that's available to just, you know, kids out in the universe, right? You, you just have these really compelling math games and they're used in the classroom and outside of the classroom. And so some kids sign up because they like math and some kids sign up because their teacher told them they had to and, and they like math too. Um, for the kids who are signing up directly, you need to be getting verifiable parental consent. When it's used in the school, if the teacher, if the data is only being used for the educational purposes, the teacher is, uh, the school is authorized to act in lieu of the parent in providing consent, the school should be telling the parents um, that they're using the service and here's what's happening with the data. Also, the FTC recommends that it not just be kind of one-off teacher in the classroom, but that this be kind of a district level decision about bringing this technology into the classroom and, and providing consent. It's an active, schools don't necessarily always know this, but it is in fact an active decision on the part of the school to determine whether or not they're gonna provide consent because if you do not have a contract, a school can say, we're not gonna act in lieu of the parent, you need to go right to the parents. Yes. What about with the growing ubiquity of one-to-one -one device share, in schools, my concern is extended learning time. So the school has consented, you are under contract, but they let the child take the device home. Now they're playing off property. If it is for the edu if the data is being used for the educational purpose of the school, that is that is under the, the, the school consent. Right? If you're doing something else with the data, you might be using it for commercial purposes then you have a parental consent issue. Also, what we tend to find in those scenarios is that the initial registration 
it, where the personal information is collected is what's done in the classroom. And afterwards, it is basic analytics that may not necessarily be considered personal information. So it, it really depends on how you're, how you're, what, what you're doing with the data, where the user is interacting and is not interacting. Yes. And, and, I, and I think we're really short on time. Let's squeeze so, one more. OK. What's happening if uh, the only PII information that we're collecting is around registration and login, and we are using the third party authentication such as Google also? Are we still need to worry about the uh, COPA or not? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. It's your site or service. It's your site or service, right? You have strict liability for all the partners that you put in. So you need to be making sure, you need to be getting a consent and making sure that your partner is, is operating in a way that's compliant with COPPA, with your privacy practices, with your, your security practices. Okay, just one more. <laughs> yes. I, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, one of the assumptions that I feel like a lot of the presenters are making, and maybe this is more for our next panel, is that, um, that there are contracts always with districts versus individual educators or teachers making decisions as curators of their own, um, you know, of what's going on in their own classroom. And so can you talk about how, as if an individual teacher or educator makes a decision to use a med tech product, what that means for consent? Yes, um, and, and I appreciate the question because that is very common. It's very common that teachers are just curating websites and apps for the classroom. There's no contract. They're not touching base with the district to see if it's approved and they can do this or, or what have you. In that case, um, the teacher is essentially acting in lieu of the parent. However, as operators, we know that that process is a bit messy. So there are no COPPA requirements around that. However, when I work with clients, I work on some really simple school-facing, user-facing information that will give the teachers sort of the guidance they need to let them know what they are collecting and give them the information they need to send home to the parent. So to you're covered by COPPA? So you're covered by COPPA, but we know that it's a really complicated area for schools. So there are ways to act as a sort of favored vendor for schools by surfacing all the good information, right? Answering all the questions they should be asking, but they don't necessarily know they should be asking. Um, sets you up as a really reliable and trustworthy partner for schools. So remember the other copper rules, I, I mean, I've come across a couple of companies who say, I get teacher permission, so you know, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. I'm like, the rest of the COPPA actually applies to you. The only right. thing you get off the hook for is the teacher permission, and the teachers cannot consent to, like we said, the you know, advertising and marketing purposes. Okay, Lynette, thank you. She's not going thank anywhere. You.